Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, thanking you so much for returning for another segment. We're going to be speaking with returning guest, Dr. Neil Skolnick, in this segment. He's joining us here as Professor of Family and Community Medicine at Jefferson Health. He's a practicing primary care physician, and he's going to talk to us about chronic kidney disease and the importance of primary care practitioners educating their patients about recognizing the signs of this invisible disease. Welcome back, Dr. Skolnick. How have you been? Neil, I've been well, and it is an absolute pleasure to be back talking with you. Well, for those who may not be familiar with you as a contributor, give us a bit of your professional background and uh, talk briefly about your role as professor of family and community medicine at Jefferson Health. Well, sure. I see patients. I also teach medical students and residents. Uh, I'm very involved academically in the area of diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and also uh, in respiratory disease, where I've sat on the NIH's uh, guideline panel for asthma. So, uh, but 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 an area that has emerged as a critical issue nationwide, and which I, I've become very interested, to be honest with you, Neil, just in the last few years, mm-hmm. is, is chronic kidney disease. Well, what prompted such an interest in it in recent times? For years, there was a really a sense of nihilism about chronic kidney disease. There was not much we could. Do it, we treat someone's blood pressure? We treat their sugar, and then as long as they were on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, we'd say that that's it. That we're going to stop worrying about it. And what's really remarkable is it really wasn't even showing up on our problem list when people had mild chronic kidney disease because we perceived it. And I'm going to come to the difference between perception ten years ago and now because the last five years have change this landscape entirely. We perceived it as something we couldn't do much about. The reason I got interested in this really started back in 2015 with the publication of a seminal article in the New England Journal about one of the SGLT2 inhibitors, a medicine that for all the world looked like its main use and only use would be to lower sh- blood sugar in diabetes. Mm-hmm. And then this paper came out, and it turns out that in addition to being effective at lowering blood sugar, which it is, this class of medicines also seems to, not seems to, has been well shown to decrease the incidence of hospitalization for heart failure and relevant to our discussion today decreases enormously the progression of chronic kidney disease. So now we say back in 2015 as if that were a long time ago. I don't know whether, you know, for you, whether it seems like a long time ago, but in the era of chronic kidney disease, that is that that pre before that is the stone ages and mm. now is modern times. So you know, over the last five years, and you, your question was, why did I, you know, when did I get interested and why? That article came out. Suddenly, chronic kidney disease is something we can do something mm-hmm. about. And over the last five years, it has been amazing the amount of new evidence in this area. March is National Kidney Month. As National Kidney Month winds down, there are a lot of people that aren't even aware of chronic kidney disease or uh, some of the, the risk factors. You know, you are so right. It's pretty remarkable. You know, the CDC reports on this, and the statistic from the CDC is that 90% of people with chronic kidney disease do not know they have it, which is pretty amazing when you think that in terms of how common it is, one out of seven adults in the United States have CKD. If we drill down even further, so that's 37 million people, but let's drill down further, right? One out of five people with hypertension have chronic kidney disease or CKD. One out of three people with diabetes, a third of people with diabetes Hmm. have chronic kidney disease, but 90% don't know they have it. What does that tell you, right? Well, it tells you, and relevant to our listeners, it tells you that if we're honest about it, it's always hard to look in the mirror. When it tells you that we're not doing a great job Mm. either identifying it or communicating to people that they have it. And if you don't know what you have, we're not finding it and patients don't know about it, we lose the opportunity to do something about it. 
isn't the fact that it's not being found, doesn't that contribute to not even knowing about it until it's well, maybe too late or in its later stages? Well, that's, that's another really good point, because if you think about it, there's two ways to look for and look at chronic kidney disease. We look for decreased function. That's a creatinine, a, a serum creatinine and measuring an EGFR, an estimated glomerular filtration rate. So that looks at kidney function. And the other way of looking at kidney function is what's called a UACR, a urine for crea a urine creatinine to albumin ratio, albumin to creatinine ratio. Now, when we look at these large studies that say, how are we doing at identifying people with chronic kidney disease? We see that about 90% of patients who are at risk get a, a basic metabolic panel that measures an EGFR, but less than 50% of them actually get a simple urine to check for a UACR, mm -hmm. urine albumin to creatinine ratio. And if you don't check for that, you're going to miss chronic kidney disease in a lot of people. And the problem with missing it, as you said, is it goes on and progresses without us having the opportunity to use really effective medicines that slow that progression. And if it progresses, a few things happen. Well, you know, and, and, and again, what we always want to know is, well, does it matter, right? Well, it matters. So that people who have worse chronic kidney disease have a higher risk for adverse cardiovascular outcomes, coronary disease and heart failure. They also, along the way, get bad chronic kidney disease, can get bad chronic kidney disease that makes you feel lousy and eventually can lead to dialysis and or renal transplantation. So there's this wonderful opportunity now with new medication to slow that progression. Talk a bit about what some of the symptoms are that I would want to get checked out. I mean, getting tested is the only way to actually tell if you have CKD, but what are some of the symptoms that I shouldn't, you know, just pawn off as something unimportant? Not so much symptoms, actually, in the earlier stages of CKD, but mm -hmm. it's risk. So in the early stages, there are no symptoms. Oh. You feel great. Or let me say, if you're going to feel great anyway, then CKD won't impair that. If you're feeling lousy anyway, you will still feel lousy, right? Mm -hmm. um, but early on, there are no symptoms. Later, you can get fatigue, and there's a host of symptoms and eventually dialysis. But the whole idea of screening is that we want to make sure we're screening correctly in those high-risk groups, um, particularly in patients and people with diabetes or other risk factors. Um, are people that the way to detect it is through the two tests that I mentioned, doing an EGFR and a UACR, urine albumin to creatinine ratio, and getting a basic metabolic panel. This is, this is really, really simple, but unless we think about it, even simple things become a reach. Now, the CDC says that uh, CKD is the ninth leading cause of death here in the United States, killing more people than breast cancer or prostate cancer. What is the one thought, the one takeaway that you'd like our listeners to get from this conversation? So the takeaway is do something. Screen for CKD in the appropriate populations with both an EGFR and a UACR. And then if they have CKD, particularly CKD three or worse, stage three or worse, address it, right? It's good glucose control, it's blood pressure control, and use the right medicines, this new class of SGLT2 inhibitors, as well as mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. We have an amazing armamentarium now. We're just kind of wetting people's taste, trying to uh, get them to pay attention, go read about it, because there's lots, lots Lots we can now do about it to help slow the progression of CKD in people who have it. Neil, thanks for returning. Always a pleasure. I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Me too. Always a pleasure being here. Thanks so much for having me here. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with returning guest, Dr. Neil Skolnick. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.